Hey friends, it's Marco and you're watching Tech with Marco. When self-hosting your applications on servers, be it a remote server or your home lab server or Raspberry Pi in your home, server security is quite an important topic. There are a lot of best practices you can apply to your server or to your situation and I really recommend doing your research here because it's very important as I just said because you don't want your server to get hijacked by any attackers. There are a lot of best practices available which you could apply on your situation and your server and your mindset and I really recommend doing your research here because as I just said it's a really important topic because so many servers out there have very poor security measures and therefore it is quite easy that they are getting hijacked pretty fast and uh, pretty automatically. So don't ever think you're very special if you're getting attacked. There are thousands and millions of attacks trying to get into your server any second in the World Wide Web and uh, they're just being uh, executed automatically. So in today's video, we're taking a first step to secure your Linux server. And you should follow this tutorial because you don't want to get your data stolen or your server to be a crypto miner for a random person. And if you haven't subscribed yet, it would really make my day if you do so now and uh, leave a thumbs up for the video and uh, yeah, let's continue. So when you log in into a server, most of the time you use the SSH protocol and this is a secure protocol by design. So there's no need to change that in any way, but we can tweak it a little bit and improve our security situation. So there are two things we will do today. First of all, we will disable our root login. So make sure to never use the root login. And the second thing is we will disable our password authentication option. From now on, we will only use our SSH keys, which we will create in the video from now on. And the best thing is these are quite easy changes. And I really recommend doing that every time you spin up a new server, or you could also even apply that automatically with deployment tools like Ansible, for example. So let's go and connect to our freshly started Ubuntu instance and connect with the root account. Now I'm getting asked from an administrator password. I'm just typing that in. And here we go. We are connected to our freshly started Ubuntu. And to show that you are being attacked right now from the beginning, um, we can have a look at the auth log in the um, var slash log directory. And you can already see that we have failed, failed password for root from this IP. We have an accepted password for root from my IP here. Uh, before that, I disconnected uh, and we have another failed co uh, connect. And as you can see, the lock is already quite long and the machine is like 10 minutes old. So <laughs> as you see, it is uh, getting attacked right from the beginning. And we want to narrow that down because using the root user is a very common standard attack. And you can prevent that from being uh, abused by just disabling the root login. So in order to disable the root login, we need another user. And this is quickly done by the command add user. So we'll type add user and then your username. And then everything is being created automatically. So we're having a new user Marco. I just put in my new Marco user group and it will create a home directory for me. And now let's choose a very secure password. And I really recommend storing the password in your KeePass database or any password database tool of your choice. You have to type it again. And now we can leave everything by default. Just hit enter all the time. And this information is correct. Yes. Now we can switch our user to our newly created user. As you can see, I'm with my Marco user at my remote machine. And I just quickly exit again. So I'm, I'm a root user again, because now with the newly created user Marco, we can't actually use admin rights at the machine. And a good thing to do is to put that user into the pseudo group. With that, we have the possibility to use our just created user, but we can also use it as an administrative user to install any new packages or to install new updates. Another thing to note, you should always update your packages. And you do that by typing a user mod and then you have to type minus A. The minus A stands for adding the groups to the already existing groups for that user. So if I would leave out the A, uh, my user would only be added into the pseudo group but would be dropped from my Marco uh, group up here. So we have to type the minus A and the minus G to specify the groups. 
and we will put the user into the group sudo. You could also add some more groups, for example docker if you have docker installed, but I don't have docker installed now, so I'll just leave out uh, docker and I'll just add Marco. And now my newly created user Marco is added to the sudo group. So he's now able to use the command sudo to install updates, for example, from the packet, package manager. But Marco, you said we will disable the password authentication. And yes, you're right, we will do that in the video. But before that, we have to create new SSH keys for that. So instead of using a password to log in, we will use a public and a private key file. And the public key file will be placed on the server and the private key file will stay on your local machine. So they're matching and each time you are connecting from your local machine to the remote machine, the remote machine checks if that private key file matches the signature of the public key. And if yes, you are being connected. And this is a very secure pattern to use. And I really recommend doing that and just follow along, we will do it now. So go back to your local machine and you have to type the command ssh minus key gen for key generation. And with the minus T option, we will specify the type of the key we want to generate. And I recommend using the ED25519 instead of RSA, for example, because this is uh, more secure than the RSA type. And to distinguish between different keys, we can put a comment at the key. And you do that by minus C. And usually it's the email address. So I just put hello at techwithmarco.com. Uh, you can choose whatever you want, but it's a standard pattern to use uh, just the email. And now we will be generating a public and private key pair and we can change the directory or the name where the key files are stored. In most cases, you can just leave that on default, but I will just change that for the video here. And I just take the standard name here. And now we're getting asked for a passphrase. You could think of it like a second factor authentication for using your key pair. This is just a matter of how secure your machine is, where the private key is stored. So if it's very secure and nobody can ever access it and the disk is encrypted, you basically can omit the password. But I recommend putting a password here because then if it's the case and your key pairs are getting stolen, the attacker still has to know your password with which you encrypted your private key pair. And therefore I recommend setting one. Make sure to store that in your password manager. And now we have two new files. So the first one is the private key file without the .pub ending. And the second one is the public key file. And let's just have a preview at the public key file. So you can, uh, you can have a preview with the CAT command. This signature has now to be uploaded to our remote server. There are different ways to do that. You could either, for example, use the SSH copy ID command, or you could just manually copy it. I will manually copy it so that you can see where I store the public key file on my uh, server here. Let's switch to our user Marco here. And let's go into the home directory. And as you can see, this is home slash Marco. And now we have to create an SSH directory. So make sure to create the dot SSH directory in your home folder of your newly created user. So let's switch into that newly created directory. And this directory is empty. And now we have to create a file. And this file is called ortho Rised underscore keys. And this authorized key file is now empty and we have to put in our public key signature in, in the first line. Now you could add multiple signatures in just another line. So feel free to add more than one or two SSH keys. Just do that with nano authorized keys. Paste that and let's close the file here. I usually use Vim, so uh, I don't know how to save that. Uh, it's Control X and we want to save that. Yes. And now let's check if that works. So first of all, we will check if the password authentication is working. And as you can see, it works. And now we want to check if the login method with our private key is working. So let's connect back to our instance here. But we will use 
the minus i option for identifying which key file we want to use. And remember, we are in the folder where our private key file is stored. So we will use the id ed255195 file. And now we have to unlock our private key with the passwords we have set. And voila, as you can see, it works with our public and private key pair. So after we've configured our user to be able to log in with a key pair instead of the password, we will disable the root login and we will disable the password authentication. For that, we have to change something in the SSH config. So let's log back into our server. So I'm still using my password here, but because we're in the sudo group, we can use our Marco user to edit the system file here. So we have to type in sudo nano, go into etc, ssh slash slash ssh dconfig. And as you can see, we will scroll down and on the bottom left, we will see permit root login and we will change that to no and there is already the password authentication set to no but if you are clever and recognize that i just used my password to log in we have to check if something else is included in that conf and i stumbled across that mistake um, but you can scroll up and see that we have a line here that this configuration here will also include every configuration which is put into the sshdconfig.d um, folder and every conf file which is in there. So uh, we will check that conf file as well, but make sure to set the permit root login to no and the password authentication to no. So we'll close that file, save that, and we will check if there is something else we have to configure. Uh, and as you can see, there's one file in there, the 50 minus cloud minus init.conf and the password authentication is set to yes. This in my case is specific because I'm using a cloud server here and they seem to have some init script which is setting that file in that folder here. So we will set the password authentication still to no. We will overwrite that. And now we have to restart the SSH service. You do that by typing sudo systemctl restart ssh and my expectation would now be that i'm not able to use the password to log in so let's open another tab here and try to log in with the password and we're getting a uh, permission denied uh, because there is no public private key provided and the only way to log in now is to use my private key here and as you can see, we are locked in. And let's check if the root login is not working and the root login is also not available. So now we've just secured our server in quite some easy steps. And there are also possibilities to automate that with Ansible Playbox, for example. And if you would like to have that, just let me know in the comments so that I can build it in the future and then maybe I can give it to you on my GitHub account. But yeah, don't think that you're now uh, secure from now on. There are still other tech patterns which you should care of and you should make your head around it. So there are things, for example, like updating your software, keep them updated. So whenever vulnerability is uh, disclosed, um, most of the times the vulnerabilities are updated in the packages. So make sure to have your packages updated. You could use firewalls, for example, like UFW or firewall D. There's also a thing if you're using lots of Docker containers, these Docker containers most of the time ignore the firewall rules and there are some workarounds for that. Or you could, for example, instead of Docker use Podman uh, because Podman is built in a way more secure way than Docker is. Podman, for example, doesn't skip the firewall rules. Um, so I'm currently reading myself into that and trying to change from Docker to use Podman. For example, you could also use some software which is called CrowdSec. I link a video where I talk about CrowdSec uh, in the corner or at my end card. So make sure to check that out. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the tutorial. Let me know in the comments if you want more security topics in my on my channel. And um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Leave a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye bye.